is a guy who is have no fear. Just look in, look into his eyes, and you understand that. He's a, he's really like a passion for winning whatever he's doing. You know, he wants to he wants to be the number one. He was just a natural talent. Just go any car that he jumped in and wrung the neck out of it, and that's uh, that's that's true for every world champion that's been. He knew what he wanted, that was to win stages, win rallies, win championships. When he was driving Mitsubishi, nobody could beat him. And it was just, if the car was just like, uh, that he was happy with the car, the result was always there. He always won rallies. He was a superhero that everybody wanted to copy. Tommy Mackinnon, superhero, rallying legend. The statistics speak for themselves, 24 WRC wins. Five times a Rally Finland winner. Four Rally Monte Carlo wins. And of course, four World Drivers' Championships. And these came in consecutive years. Tommy Mackinnon was born and bred in Pupala near Ivaskila, which, as any rally fan knows, is Rally Central in Finland. But the man who is to become one of the sport's greats was a relative late starter. Born in 1964, it was 1985 before he competed in a rally. When I did my first rally, I was already 20. And uh, I think it looked good it looked actually very good when i started 86 90 more serious 90 with Krupenka doing some world, world championship run brought up in a farming community his first motorsport success was at a much slower pace tommy was twice a national plowing champion but once behind the wheel of a rally car people started to sit up and take notice when i, I started in the mid 90s uh, we were at nissan uh, and tommy was driving a nissan um, so it was a very long time ago british championship flashing around the british forests in a, in a two-wheel drive car that's when i first remember tommy uh, and set in extraordinary stage times and then having big accidents and it was always this cross between huge speed and big incidents so uh, but then obviously he got that under control very very quickly and Tommy was starting to get it under control this potent mix of speed and control brought him to the attention of some fellow Finns you and me you are uh, we we are thinking in the end of the uh, uh, 80s that uh, there are no new things in the scene. So what, what can we do for that? And then we started doing some research and uh, Tommy's name popped up. The relationship with Timo opened the way for Tommy to enter the international arena. As 1990 saw him compete in the FIA Championship for production cars. And Timo's influence saw him take two class wins on his way to finishing third overall in the championship. This season had also been Tommy's first with Seppo Hariana as his co-driver. Seppo had already claimed a world championship alongside Timo Salonen in 1985. His experience was going to be crucial if Tommy was to break into the big time. But that break was a long time coming, with just a limited amount of outings in the early 90s, driving Lancias, Mazdas, Sierras and Nissans. Then in 1994, Tommy got the offer to drive a WRC Ford Escort in his home event. This car was tested and set up by current Ford boss Malcolm Wilson. Literally, he just got in like most Finns do. They just get in and drive, and as long as they know the car is, it's got you know four, a wheel on each corner, then they seem to be very happy. And, and and Tommy was one of those sort of people that you know, as long as you know the, the wheels were pointing in the right direction, then you knew that he would just give his 100%. He probably wasn't on everybody's list of favourites before the rally, because at the time he wasn't a factory driver, um, and he was just trying to get that opportunity. And uh, he basically dominated the rally, won it fair and square, and it was the turning point for him when it was when he was recognised as um, you know, a potential future champion. I think at that point, up until that point, he'd been full of promise, but he'd never quite got the breaks that he deserved. I was spectating on that rally and uh, it was 90 degree right hand bend and Tommy went uh, came into that junction and he turned right and when he was acceler accelerating out from that corner he was actually looking out from the side window like oh there's some spectators and going bigger gears so he, he that was like the thing that you saw that he was very 
confident to win that rally that year. And Tommy was already being courted by Mitsubishi, who put him in one of their works cars for the 1994 San Remo Rally. Obviously, he'd gone very well to win Finland Rally, but I wouldn't say it was disregarded as a result, but uh, a Finn on his home territory is a bit specialised, and uh, it was only when we saw him outside his home country on a World Championship event that uh, I think people began to take notice. I saw that Tommy is a young driver, good, uh, good investment for future. He will be uh, maybe champion in future, and he have a motivation. And so began one of the greatest partnerships in rally history, Tommy Mackinnon and Mitsubishi. The 1995 season would still be about learning, especially now that he was driving for a team rather than for Tommy Mackinnon. He missed out on his first win for Mitsubishi through team orders while he still had some learning to do on the driving side, with a few too many off-roads against his name. Tommy was discovering it was tough at the top, but a win in Finland, a non-championship event in 1995, was a great confidence booster. But there were still question marks over his future with the team. Tommy felt he was uh, needing a full world championship program. And at that point, Mitsubishi hadn't fully committed to uh, uh, doing all the events. Uh, but uh, Kenneth Erickson moved to Subaru. Mitsubishi made the commitment to a full world championship event. So effectively, Tommy had got the position that, that he needed in the team. Oh, so the car was right, the team was right, Tommy had everything he needed, time to start winning world championships. See you after the break. Welcome back to the WRC's Greatest Drivers. We're looking back on the career of Tommy Mackinnon. Tommy was now installed as the number one driver at Mitsubishi. And 1996 was the team's first full-scale assault on the World Rally Championship. The season started in the snow of Sweden, and Tommy left his rivals under no illusion that he meant business, leading practically from start to finish. But whereas he was very much at home in the snow of his native Scandinavia, the next round of the championship, Kenya's Safari Rally, was a very different prospect. In those days, you could take the rally car out on the competitive sections before the event just to shake it down. And uh, Tommy went out and did the first two competitive sections and uh, he drove the car really too hard. By the time he completed those two sections, the car was a mess. And we had quite a strong meeting with Tommy, Andrew Cowan, myself, Lassie Lampy, And Andrew said, look, Tommy, if you're going to drive like that, we might as well go home now. Uh, the car isn't going to survive. Tommy just went out and nailed it. He just drove faultlessly. He just drove a classic safari event. He really scared people on the first couple of sections, and then he just controlled it from the front. Tommy had some some uh, incredible uh, road reading and understanding, so he could adjust the speed much better in Kenya than anybody else I know. He could see that okay, this hole and this place, I can go flat out. You kind of a rally where you had to drive with your eyes open and very, very open. I think at that point, a, a very important lesson was learned uh, by Tommy that he didn't have to be absolutely flat out everywhere. Tommy tended to drive the car very much as a switch. In other words, it was all on or all off. It was hard on the brakes or hard on the throttle. And I think from that safari, he, he learned that, OK, there are times you don't have to blitz the opposition completely. So I think an important lesson was learned. Uh, but there were still gaps to fill, uh, for instance, on tarmac. He was still very much an unknown quantity on tarmac. But any deficiencies on tarmac would be an irrelevance in 1996. Retirement in Indonesia was followed by a second place in Greece and a win in Argentina, another event where judgment of pace is crucial. Argentina was something special. He went there first time on his life and he won the rally. And with his third consecutive win in Finland, he was leaving the likes of Carlos Sainz, Juha Kankanen and reigning world champion Colin McRae way behind in the race for the championship. There were just nine events in 1996 and by the time he arrived in Australia for round seven, he was on the verge of lifting his first world driver's title. It was almost too easy. 
It's never easy, but uh, once he got in the groove, the confidence was there, and he was able to exploit the car, exploit his own talent, uh, and bring the car to the finish in, in quite often a leading position. Uh, and so he made it look easy. I'm sure it wasn't. And for good measure, he won in Australia. He did a great job. He was very, very clear on his approach. He had a good apprenticeship. He learns very, very easily and quickly. No, there was never a more deserving champion. So Tommy had proved himself the man to beat. Team principal Andrew Cowan, the driving force behind the Mitsubishi Rally program, leading the celebrations. But more importantly, the Mitsubishi Lancer had proved itself the car to beat. This was a partnership that was going to make history. <laughs> As you've seen at the centre of the Tommy Mackinnon success story is his relationship with Mitsubishi. He delivered their first World Drivers' Championship and all but two of his 24 WRC wins came at the wheel of the Lancer. But did Mitsubishi make Tommy or did Tommy make Mitsubishi? I believe that they made each other um, in, in total fairness. Without a doubt, the, the Mitsubishi had been around in that form for two years really before Tommy came along and it hadn't succeeded. The team felt the car was good. They had uh, Kenneth Erickson doing his best, Armin Schwartz, a few other drivers mixing in uh, and really struggling with it. Tommy came along and made that car. The two things just came together and it was perfect. The car was perfect for Tommy, Tommy was perfect for the car and for the team. There was a lot of discussion about our car and, uh, and the drivers and everybody complained the car. And I was quite confident the car is okay. But uh, we need somebody who stops uh, complaining and, and, uh, and he comes and drives. It was a partnership that both sides needed the other. Uh, it wasn't really a case that Mitsubishi built the car or the team around him. Uh, Tommy wanted a strong but fast car. Mitsubishi wanted a driver who is, was fast enough and had the ability to win events. Obviously the team was, was ready to have somebody of Tommy's ability and Tommy was just coming to his peak. Um, and they pair, the, the, the combination just clicked at that point in time, but I mean it was a, it was a very strong combination for a, for a number of years. And sitting by Tommy's side of course was the man who'd been with him since 1990, Seppo Hariana. Seppo was massively experienced, uh, Tommy he had some experience but obviously on some events he was a little bit uh, fresh and new. Uh, Seppo was very good at keeping him in, in, the, in the right line and uh, not making mistakes uh, too often. What you need on rallying is experience and uh, there is plenty of things what you can learn but there is plenty of things what you can uh, give him so that he don't have to learn it and Seppo was the person, correct person uh, to take that side of the car to, to take all that pressure away from, from Tom. Tommy would never have come across anything in all those years as he, as he built up his career and, and moved into WRC. He would never have come across anything that would have faced Seppo. Seppo would have just said, yeah, don't worry about this, this is fine. But of course, a team is more than just driver, co-driver and car. Mitsubishi, led by Andrew Cowan, was a family type of a team. It was very, very, very relaxed and good atmosphere over there. And I think the team and Tommy matured together. I worked uh, hard, everybody worked hard, and uh, everybody was happy when we keep winning, and so it was very, very long period of uh, good success and good team spirit. Was, it was really good. Good team, fantastic team, all the team members, and Tommy was part of that. Uh, team is as strong as your weakest link. We had no weak links. But one of the strongest links was Lassie himself, who as test driver was crucial in setting up the car for Tommy. I know that at Mitsubishi the car setup had been going from, from A to Z and back to A and back to W again uh, with the previous drivers. When Tommy came, Tommy accepted and trusted uh, Lassie's setup information. The, the, 
The car was set up in that fashion, they just committed to it, and Tommy went out and did the job. He made everything ready for Tommy. It was the job of driving was Tommy's job. Not that much testing, even though he did a lot of testing, but Lasse had already prepared everything. So, And in, in the rallies, his advice was invaluable. He was never never worried about the car. He always, there was 100% uh, uh, trust in between Tommy and myself, in between team and Tommy. So he knew that if we say that, okay, we test it, we have done this and this, he said, all right, I'm happy. Swedish rally, I had no time to test him at all. We, I, did, I did zero test for, for Sweden. He was tested the car, and uh, I just jumped into the car, and so I win it. I won the rally without any testing. That was the, the that was real example how well it can work together if you have a good release. So Tommy had the perfect team to match his talents and had strolled to his first driver's title in 1996. But 1997 would be a different proposition and it was a difficult start to the season. His third place in Monte Carlo, an event he was still learning, was satisfactory. Round two was on more familiar ground on the snow in Sweden. But as strong as the team were, for once they did not get it right. The Sweden rally, I remember that the team, we had sequential gearbox first time and we decided to change the gearbox just in case security was nothing wrong and something went wrong on the gear change and uh, he got maximum time penalty out of the service but he was almost out of the rally and he lost the lead and still before the last special stage he was fighting again to win the rally he lost it because he spun second last special stage but he lost only a few seconds to get Tommy's a guy that you could never ever dismiss right to the end of an event. He was capable of, of producing a phenomenal performance. It was just a scary guy. But it would be just another third place finish. And there would be no happy return to the Safari Rally. His Mitsubishi Lancer came off second best to the Kenyan roads, retiring with broken suspension and transmission on day two. Of course, there would be problems from time to time, but I think the confidence that he developed enabled him to get through the, the bad rallies, knowing that there would be good rallies to come. And a win in Portugal put him back in contention. And on the tarmac of Spain's Rally Catalonia, he would give further notice that he was still the man to beat. Many Finns, they say that, oh, tarmac is not for me. Tommy said that I like tarmac. Uh, so Tommy was at time as good as whoever in uh, in uh, Mediterranean area or, or tarmac, I say, I say tarmac specialist, but there is no tarmac specialist. There is rally drivers, and if you are confident, you can do it. Many drivers, when you talk to them, they say, I'm pushing really hard on tarmac, it's impossible to go any faster. With Tommy, he drives more smoothly, he doesn't make the car go sideways, he actually understands the fastest way to drive on tarmac. He's just figured it out, basically. Simple as that, and no one else has managed to do that. And Tommy was confident on gravel, on snow, on tarmac, on mud, everywhere. Every single rally we went, we knew that we have a chance to win. He may have taken a huge step towards becoming the complete driver, but champions need a fair slice of luck. And in the next round on the Corsican tarmac, something nasty was waiting around the corner. Tommy came upon this cow. Uh, he, he'd nowhere to go apart from hit the cow, after which he bounced off the rock face, through a wall, and ended up about 30 metres down in, the, in a river. We were lucky that there were no serious injuries, but it was, it was quite, a, a, quite a big, big crash. In a way, that showed Tommy's resilience, that he could come back from an accident like that, which could have affected him quite badly in the opposite direction. But uh, he knew there were rallies coming that, that would suit him, and uh, he, he just got on with it. And get on with it, he did, notching up further wins in Argentina and, of course, Finland. By the time he reached the final round in Great Britain, he needed just a point to retain the championship. But he was not in the best of shape. He was uh, in fever before the rally. Like normally coming to England, Tommy always gets a fever for some reason, I don't know. 
uh, and uh, it wasn't so easy. His closest challenger was Colin McRae, who'd won the previous two events and was well on the way to making it a third in his home rally. Tommy needed that single point. He didn't need to win the rally, which he didn't really like driving like that. He wanted to be driving full on, and, and that clearly had its risk for that event. So he just had to be patient and, and drive around to get, get the one point. But he absolutely hated it, and we, we were worried that he might just lose patience uh, and throw the car off somewhere, and then we wouldn't even get, get the single point. But I think, again, that's where Seppo helped tremendously uh, to just keep him on the right side of disaster. But amongst the British fog, a top gear spin and problems with a slipping clutch, Tommy got home in sixth place, claiming that single point, beating Colin McRae, the man who preceded him as world champion, to the title. These were great times for the WRC with the likes of Juha Kankanen, Carlos Sainz and Didier Oriol battling for honours along with the emerging talents of Richard Burns. But one rivalry stood out, Tommy versus the late, great Colin McRae. It was very strongly the sort of the Mitsubishis in the red corner and the Subarus in the blue corner and, and Tommy is very clearly a, a Mitsubishi driver and sort of, you know, always will be, I guess, in those terms. When the chips were down, <clears throat> that's when I think those two guys were at, were at the peak, they were at the top of the game, they could, uh, I don't know, they just had this ability to be able to drive around, around problems. Very similar in nature. Uh, both uh, Colin and, uh, and, and Tommy, uh, they both like to live on the edge and ride motorbikes fast and do anything fast and they're both true fighters in cars, uh, their commitment was incredible and Tommy would recognise that immediately, there was other drivers in the championship who were probably more tactical but he, he probably knew if he was going into a stage and he was having to fight for a win with Colin behind him he knew he could have a big problem because you can't play mind games with, with somebody like Colin, he would just give it his all on any stage. He and Colin were quite similar drivers in many ways, um, but they were very, very keen rivals. And when you're looking down a, a set of stage times, you'd, you'd look for those two uh, to see who was setting the pace. Usually it would be one of those two at the top. They were the two guys, they were the only two guys I think at the time who could actually I think they could pick a particular stage, you know, Tommy would pick one and uh, Colin would pick another and they would make a real serious effort on the recce and, you know, and it tended to be the longer stages, the more difficult ones, or the ones where they really felt they could push the limit. And the thing is, those guys, you know, could, could actually win an event on, um, on that stage, they could basically outside the, the opposition. It was always a, a close fight between them, unless uh, you know, some mechanical problem intervened for either of them. They were always pretty close one way or the other. But it wasn't just mechanical problems that would separate them. Usually they wound the pace up so much that it was all over by halfway through. I can remember some fantastic battles in New Zealand, for instance, but they ended up with you know, Tommy in a ditch or whatever fairly early on. Always something happened. Either I went off or Colin went off. And we, never, we never give up at all. We just pushed flat out. But in 1998, it would be Carlos Sainz who would provide the sternest test for Tommy in a championship that would end in the most dramatic style. Join us after the break. Welcome back to our profile of Tommy Mackinnon, one of the WRC's greatest. the race for the Drivers' Championship in 1997 had been a close-run thing, 1998 would eclipse that. Tommy would also be contesting this season with a new co-driver, Risto Manisamaki, taking over from the retiring Seppo Haryana. And it would be a difficult start of the season for the new pairing. They led after day one of Monte Carlo thanks to a sensational performance on the final stage when he opted to go without studded tyres, even though there was ice and snow on the roads. But any ideas Tommy had of adding a first Monte Carlo win to his CV were quickly ended when he crashed out on the first stage of day two. He returned to winning ways in Sweden, but retirements followed on the next two events. 
engine failure brought an early end to his safari adventure, although Mitsubishi did have the consolation of seeing Richard Burns achieve his first WRC win. While Portugal brought another rally-ending crash, was having to bed in a new co-driver affecting Tommy's performance. Risto Manison Mackey uh, was an experienced co-driver, but not to the level that, that Sepa Haryana was. So, in a way, Risto was learning uh, at quite a quick rate uh, to catch up with Tommy. Uh, and I think Tommy missed Seppo's guidance initially. But having said that, I think Risto came up to speed very quickly. It's now his, really his third, uh, in, in, into his fourth year in the championship. It's easy to fall into habits and think, you know, well, I'm going to do this. I've done Monte the last three years. We'll do this again. It's easy to get, not blasé, but just perhaps less focused. And, you know, you don't win everything all the time. That doesn't happen in, in, in any sport and certainly not in rally. So it had been a difficult first half of the season for Tommy. But his old rivals, McRae, Sainz and Kankinen, were also struggling for consistency. And with his second and third wins of the season in his happy hunting grounds of Argentina and Finland, Tommy was right back in contention. This was his fifth consecutive win in Finland. He was certainly the master of his home event. It is very fast. I think it is clearly fastest here. Very accurate lines. So fast jumps. You have to know exactly the place where you go flat out oh, because you can fly easily 20 meters whatever 25 meters just need to make sure that you land it on the road otherwise it is quite <laughs> it is it's very very special over the crest all the time you don't see anything far it's uh, that makes it quite special and difficult to win in Finland at that speed for all them events is, is fairly outstanding. Nobody could get near him. Uh, it showed his passion for the championship rally in his own country, and that drove him on a lot. And he delivered great. You know, it's a great job what he did there for the for the fans in Finland. The general scheme of things, he never pressured himself. That's why he won so many times. He said, "I'm just going to take this as another event." He didn't get revved up. He didn't get too excited. And what he could do on the Finnish gravel, he could do on the Italian tarmac, as he followed his home win with a victory in San Remo. His victory in Australia made it three wins in a row, and he was now the leader in the championship. Arriving for the grand finale in Great Britain with a two-point lead over Toyota's Carlos Sainz. But this event would get off to the worst possible start for Tommy. disaster on the state's number was it four something like that uh, organizers run a historic uh, rally on tarmac before uh, international world championship event and uh, one hillman imp blown his engine on that corner what we are maybe talking and uh, tommy was first car on the road because he was leading championship there was oil on the tarmac so he hit that oil without any warning got the slide big slide hit the rear uh, right rear wheel on the concrete block, lost the wheel. It was really one of the worst moments for me. I ha we had no hurry to make the title. It was no hurry at all. I just needed to drive and finish the rally and that's it. And it was looking very, very easy. At that point, we all thought, well, finally, you know, Tommy, he can't come back from this, can he? All we've got to do is get Carlos into fifth position. So we ran the mappings back on the car. Carlos drove very, very carefully and slowly. In his mind, the championship was over. All Carlos had to do was to cruise around to finish. Um, and first of all, he came to me, can I go home? No, Tommy, I think you need to stay. He then went over my head to Andrew. Andrew, please let me go home. I, I hate staying here when I'm not part of this rally. And Andrew said, no, sorry, Tommy, you, you can't go, but we'll compromise. You can pack your bags. 
find yourself a hotel at Heathrow, check into there, stay there, and the moment Carlos crosses the finish line on the final stage, then you can get the next flight back home to Finland. And this is Carlos approaching the end of the last stage in third position, enough to give him the championship. Carlos's engine let go, which was a very unusual occurrence in a Toyota, and it, I, can't, I can't really recall that it happened more than twice in ten years, and it happened on that occasion. Um, and uh, you, could, you could nearly believe in a deity at that point. It was such a strange thing to happen. And all this happened just 500 metres from the end of the rally. A heartbreaking moment for Carlos Sainz and co-driver Luis Moya. Tommy, I think, first took a phone call from his brother, who was in the stage and saw that Carlos was in trouble. Uh, and Tommy thought this was a wind-up, uh, and didn't believe him. Um, of course, all hell was letting loose in, in our service park as, as the events unfolded. Um, so Andrew was on the phone to Tommy fairly quickly, saying, Tommy, get yourself down to Cheltenham. Uh, and uh, I think it was only then that reality finally sunk in that he, he was the world champion again in that year. Everybody said that Tommy was lucky. You are not lucky if you win world championship after 14 rounds and you have more points than anybody else. All, all events are counted. It doesn't matter if you retired on the first one or on the last one. And with Richard Burns winning the event, Mitsubishi had also won their first manufacturer's title. Some weekend for Tommy and the team. Tommy had dealt with all the WRC could throw at him and come out with three successive drivers' championships, which already ranked him among the greats. But what were the ingredients that put him up there? What set Tommy apart as a driver? It's probably one of the last of the old school drivers. You know, he gets in the car and he's on it, his commitment is there completely. And he's just one of them characters who, who give absolutely everything in the car. You'll have seen some great in car with him, with his pure aggression in the car. And uh, that's where his speed came from. He, he attacked massively uh, in the, in some stages, you know, like taking a huge amount of time, time out of somebody. It just seems like sometimes he took his brain out and just left it uh, at the service, you know. And uh, that's Tommy. He had that maximum uh, attacking feeling, what, uh, what you need when you want to win. There was no option with Mitsubishi. It was... Uh, the car was built to go flat out. The car was very, very difficult to drive if you drive slowly. If you, for some reason, you, had, you could slow down, you, you had to slow down. It was very, very difficult. I didn't like to drive at all. It was so, so hard. Until you went completely flat out, it worked okay again. So that's why nearly everywhere I had to push quite hard. <laughs> But it wasn't all maximum attack. To be the best, speed needs to be combined with control. He basically has a built-in um, traction control device on his right foot. He's got such a delicate right foot on the throttle that uh, he's able to really drive the car smoothly, keep, keep control of it, and, and he doesn't have the habit of going sideways like everyone else. You know, it, it, it just, it, I think it just indicates just how clever he is. I was looking his driving style and I, I really like his, his driving style. Uh, sliding just a little bit, but uh, very precise all the time. It was uh, one of my favorite uh, drivers. And another of the current generation of drivers has benefited from observing Tommy's style close up. Yeah, in the year 2003, we we drove the Ford Focus World Rally car and uh, together in the in the winter time and basically he sold me the the way how should be drive how I should drive. Then we swapped over. He came with me in the car and I was showing what I was doing and <laughs> after a few kilometers say, hey, Yari Matt, stop stop, I cannot be with you anymore. <laughs> Let me drive <laughs> because I had so much sideways all the time and uh, then he showed me again, look, Yari Matti, look. This is the way you have to go. Be very smooth, and then 
smooth in the corners and then accelerate with a straight car. And then I, I saw first time the really a different driving style. And there was still more in the arsenal, along with Tommy's fast, fluid driving style. Tommy, he was very, very good in uh, improv improvising on stages. He had very good pace notes, but I did some tests with him, and actually I was not reading pace notes on the road, he didn't know. And actually he was going very, very quick on site, so I think that's something which made him very, very big. Great vision and a sharp mind as well. He is a very clever driver. People underestimate how clever Tommy is. You don't become a four, four times world champion without being able to think clearly and how you're going to do an event. He was very good at pacing himself through an event to get a result at the end. He was so focused on the job he did. Whatever happens, you know, he was just concentrating for his own side to go from here to there as quick as possible. And uh, for example, very difficult to get any feedback from the States, what happened on the States from him. He couldn't remember. Always you have to go to the to go co driver if he hit something or whatever, because he, put, he was so concentrated. That was the main thing, you know, to concentrate. He knew what he wanted. Uh, he knew how to drive the car. He knew how to get the best out of it. Uh, and it, if we could give him the equipment, quite often he, he would deliver the result. If Tommy needed to achieve one thing to prove he was the complete driver, it was to win in Monte Carlo. And at the season opener in 1999, his time had come, and he won it comfortably, despite a major brake failure on the first day. He won Monte Carlo. Always difficult rally. First Monte Carlo win. So that was something special for Tommy, for team. Yep. If he was going to win the championship again in 99, this was an event which really he needed to win. And he, he just did a fantastic job and, and, and did that, which, which set up a, a, another winning season. He topped the podium in Sweden, where his mastery was almost on a par with Finland. This was also Mitsubishi's sixth consecutive WRC win. But he would have another uncomfortable time in safari, his event ending with exclusion after receiving help from spectators to change a puncture. An average run of results followed, but the Mitsubishi was completing events and picking up points, which meant Tommy maintained the lead in the championship. And a win in New Zealand consolidated this. Surely round 10 rally Finland was a chance to further enhance his chances of retaining his driver's championship. But acting as road sweeper on day one, he struggled to match the pace of Juha Kankinen and Richard Burns, who were both now driving Subarus. And transmission failure on day two would destroy any chance of making it six in a row in Finland. But he was still championship leader. His closest challenger had emerged as Didier Oriol, world champion, in 1994. And when Tommy crashed out in China, victory for Oriol saw the Frenchman in the Toyota draw level. Time for a big performance from the Mitsubishi man, and his arena was to be San Remo, where he put in what many regard as his finest ever performance. Take maximum points here, he had to overcome the Peugeot 206 of Gilles Panizzi, a tarmac expert in a better tarmac car. If you're putting Gilles Panizzi in a Peugeot on tarmac on those roads, you'd have to say he'd be favourite to win a, a battle against Tommy. And that's the way it looked going into the final day. On Sunday morning we had to leave very early to the hotel to go to the service park to start a rally and I remember very well like every driver no, but they don't like to get up very early and when I came to the breakfast Tommy just came in about from a one hour walk with his personal uh, uh, assistant uh, to breakfast and everybody was surprised what are you doing he said I'm just just been out for a one hour walk because I want to be ready for the first stage and on the first stage I still remember that he beat I think Jill Panizzi by 12 or 13 seconds to go into the lead of the rally but the result was still in the balance going into the final stage and with the rain falling everything needed to be right they went into the last stage fairly close together uh, in terms of time. 
Tommy opted for a, a softer compound tyre, but he was under strict instruction from Lassie Lampy that uh, when he started to feel the tyres go off towards the top of the stage, as he almost certainly would, then he was to back off for a few Ks, let the, the tyres come back with their performance, and then push again on, on the downhill. And he, he timed it absolutely perfectly. Uh, and consequently, he, he got to the end, uh, having beaten uh, Panizzi in the end quite comfortably. For a lot of people, that was one of Tommy's greatest moments. Tommy was now the outright championship leader again, but the pressure was on. And it was Oriel who cracked, crashing out on the first day in Australia. His co-driver, Dennis Giraudet, was inconsolable. Tommy now just needed a top three finish to make it four drivers' championships in a row, but it would not be an easy ride. Tommy hit the lock, lost the rear cross member, so we managed to fix his car. Uh, then on the final, st second last stage, you know, he hit something, bent the rear suspension. We had 20 minutes time to fix his car and it was not a small damage at all, you know. So the boys managed to, to weld it all together so that he, he was safe through the stage, you know. It was looking easy, but it wasn't easy for the team. He had now equaled the feat of his countryman Juha Kankinen in winning four world titles, a record. But Tommy had done it in consecutive years. Join us after the break for the continuation of the Tommy Mackinnon story. Tommy Mackinnon had established himself as one of the greats of rallying, recording four consecutive driver's titles between 1996 and 1999. But the balance of power was shifting in the World Rally Championship. Ford were making great strides with Carlos Sainz joining Colin McRae behind the wheel of the Focus. Richard Burns, now with Subaru, was continuing to flourish. In the 2000 season, Tommy couldn't even claim to be the number one Finn as Marcus Gronholm emerged in the Peugeot 206 to become the new world driver's champion. Clearly, the, the Peugeot was getting better uh, and perhaps the Mitsubishi was a little bit static. So as the season developed, it became clear that it was becoming more and more of a, of a struggle to, to beat the, the Peugeot. The season had begun with another win in Monte Carlo, the 20th of his career. But Tommy was defeated by Gronholm in Sweden. Even that early in the season, the writing was on the wall. After Swedish victory for Marcus, it started to look that, OK, we are not going to, to win this year, and that happened. And uh, after four years winning, so much pressure on, it was not so good feeling also for Tommy. He lost a little bit his motivation, you know, during that year. But uh, then later on, we came back again next year with Tommy. And 2001 began with a third successive win in Monte Carlo. Tommy's run of success on this most famous and difficult of events would become another part of his legacy. Tommy really excelled on Monte Carlo, uh, I think probably more so than any of the other asphalt rallies. And I think again it was because of he could cope very well with difficult and changing conditions. Um, so I think that always put him in, in, in good stead for, for, for events like, like Monte Carlo. As Monte Carlo proved, he was the master of changing grip situations. The reason he won Monte Carlo was because he could cope with uh, going from snow to dry tarmac. Uh, so his mechanical uh, understanding of the tyres in those situations was very, very good. Tommy's driving style suited really difficult conditions. Um, he's quite conservative on sort of breaking and corner entry and gets his exits absolutely perfect. And that safety margin, that approach really worked well in Monte Carlo. Tommy celebrated his 100th WRC start with a win at a rain-soaked rally Portugal. And finally added another win at the Safari to his CV. This was also his 23rd WRC victory, which put him level with McRae, Sainz and Kankinen at the top of the all-time standings. He was also leading the championship, but Safari was followed by the embarrassment of a first stage crash and retirement in Finland. Oh, 
one. I wanted to go flat out and I just got one corner too much and find some tree stump. <laughs> This season had also seen the Group A Lancer, which had taken Tommy to his four world titles, replaced by the WRC version, and Tommy was struggling to adapt. I'm sure that I could win another fifth title, I could win 2000, 2001 with uh, with old car, but uh, we couldn't continue with that, and I was very, very disappointed. <laughs> And it was an unhappy time in the new car. A big off in Corsica, in which Risto Manisamaki was badly hurt, was followed by a retirement on the first day of Rally Great Britain. And this was to be Tommy's last event for Mitsubishi, as his contract was up, a deal with Subaru followed. Uh, I always felt that uh, Tommy was associated with Mitsubishi and the, all the Evos. I was disappointed that he went to, to Subaru, uh, but obviously the direction that Mitsubishi was going was perhaps not what Tommy wanted either, so I suppose a, a parting of the ways was inevitable at some point. So Tommy started the 2002 season with Mitsubishi's great rival Subaru and with a new co-driver, Kai Lindstrom, replacing the still-injured Risto Manisamaki, and things started well with Tommy's fourth successive win in Monte Carlo. Yes, it does. On next one. It's always good for the team when you get a driver of that sort of charisma, stature, whatever you want to call it. It just lifted the team. It helped us to sort of generate a new kind of enthusiasm. What everybody learned very quickly about Tommy was how bloody-mindedly determined he can be. Um, and uh, that was his, probably the strength that stood out, you know, how, how hard he would push, how strong he was. And um, we never gave up. And he certainly wasn't giving up in Argentina when fighting for victory on the last day with the man who'd assumed his mantle, Marcus Gronholm. There's two stages to go, and he said, well, the next one, now I'm going to push, and I'm going to catch him. And you felt that from the first corner, that, OK, never mind what I'm saying. I, you could just say that it's left, it's, it's right. No point to say how fast you can go or how sharp is the corner because he was just nailing it every place. Ooh, ooh. Tommy and Kai's rally ended in the most spectacular style. <laughs> So it was maximum attack to the end of his career and the 2003 season was to be his last. By this time, Tommy was playing a support role at Subaru to Petter Solberg, who was emerging as a serious challenger for the Drivers' Championship. And Tommy would play his part in Petter winning that title. Tommy knows what it's like to win championships and he knows how to win championships. So he did support Petter from the background. He knew that Petter had the opportunity to win that year. And from about halfway through the year, especially up to Corsica, he, he gave him a lot of support. And uh, it gave Petter confidence and the, the, the uh, will to win as well. Tommy would, um, uh, was, was quite happy at that stage in his career to sort of to share his experience with Petter and to, to coach him into sort of looking at the championship rather than trying to win every stage of every rally. Tommy's final event was Rally Great Britain and it was the stage for one last battle with Colin McRae as they fought for third position. I felt he really enjoyed that there was a big battle against Colin on that rally which they've had in the previous rallies. And Tommy came out on top. He was on the podium for one last time. And Petter Solberg took the victory and joined Tommy on the list of drivers who have become world champion. The scenes in Wales that day were some of the most memorable in WRC history, and Tommy was very much part of it. He finished at the top of the game, on the podium. So many drivers have lingered and continued on and not managed that. It was a fantastic last event, very, very poignant uh, for, for him, for his family, for all his fans and his management. It was sorry to see, you know, you're the passing of a legend. So Tommy's career ended with 24 WRC wins. Only four drivers have won more, while his record of four consecutive drivers' championships has only recently been equaled by Sebastian Loeb, a true rally legend. Winning the 
four times world championship in a row. I think that's something that uh, there were so many good drivers competing at the same time. There was Colin, Carlos, Juha, etc., etc. So for me, that was very, very big achievement that he he did on that time. He just went on this roller coaster for four or five years where uh, he just could walk on water. Uh, everything he did uh, it was just perfect. Uh, he just won event after event, won championship after championship, uh, and it's that sort of thing that uh, is the making of a legend, and that's exactly what he is. To win so many titles and so many events in a relatively short space of time it was, was truly impressive. I have to put him in the top three drivers of all time. And please don't ask me who the other two drivers are. Tommy is a great guy as a person too. He's not only a, a great sportsman, but he's a great person. A, a great sportsman, that's how I'd sum him up. One of the great, great rally men, that's where I'd put it. He's a caring person also at the same time. And uh, he's, not, he's not many sports people or who have achieved so much who still, you know, think about the whole picture and see, uh, take care of people around him, you know, so that's good. Of course, afterwards it's nice to think about all these titles and things, but I think they're not changing my life very much.